You're listening to a sermon podcast from Redemption Hill Church, recorded at one of our worship services. I would now like to read our scripture passage for today, which comes from Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 to 15. Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 to 15. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses, by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. These are the true words of the living God. Thank you, Divya. Afternoon, everyone. Afternoon. Uh, my name is Ekeong, one of the pastors of Redemption Hill Church. Just want to extend a warm welcome to you, especially if you're here, you're visiting for the first time or first few times really want to welcome you. It's, uh, usually I'll be at the third congregation, which is at 2.30 in the afternoon, but it's always a pleasure and a delight to be worshipping with you all, to be singing praises with uh, you, you all. Um, and I want to say that we're in our second week of our sermon series on the gospel made visible. Last week, Simon showed us that the church is all about the gospel. And that's because the gospel created the church and therefore the church's primary role is to point to the gospel and I'm not sure whether you're aware, but week in, week out, we are trying to communicate the gospel, especially in our Sunday gatherings, right? We, we pray the gospel, we sing the gospel, we confess the gospel, we preach the gospel. But are you aware that you don't just hear and listen to the gospel, but you also taste and touch the gospel? While we taste the gospel in communion uh, every two weeks, of the month, right? And we touch the gospel for those of us who have been baptized when we go into the water. And so the sacraments are really gospel sacraments. The sacraments are really gospel made visible. God is pleased not just to communicate the gospel to us in word form, but he wants to press in the gospel and its riches by appealing to all of our senses. And that's what the sacraments is all about. If you like, uh, the sacraments is really a multi-sensorial, multi-sensory presentation of the gospel. And so from this week and the next two weeks, we're going to be looking at baptism and communion and how they are gospel sacraments. You know, when I knew that I had to preach a, a sermon on baptism, I was thinking, like, what is there to say apart from, like, if you haven't get baptized, just go and get baptized, you know. <laughs> we're done in five minutes, right? But as I studied the text more deeply, um, it was actually really moving to me. There's a lot in baptism that God has gifted to us in this sacrament that he wants to communicate to us. So before we begin, can I just take us uh, in prayer? Let's go to God in prayer for help. Father God, today we have been singing again and again that Jesus is enough. Whether it's in our songs, in our confession, as Stevia led us earlier, but we know that Jesus is enough will only remain abstract and conceptual unless Jesus, you yourself, press those truths in in a very visceral and tangible way. And so we ask then, we know that faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of Christ. But the word of Christ is not just a word about Christ. It's a word that comes from Christ himself. It's Christ speaking to his people. And so I pray this afternoon, won't you show us the riches of our union with Christ and how baptism expresses that union. We ask for your help. Sustain us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We deal with symbols in our daily lives. 
on their own, symbols are not significant. But when invested with meaning, symbols actually mean more than we realize. Let's just take the ring that I wear, right? Is this ring significant? Well, to many of us, it's just a piece of metal, right? But we know that the ring communicates more than just like its material, right? We go to weddings, and weddings are incomplete without the exchange of rings. Those of us who are married and who wear rings, you know what happens when you lose your ring? <laughs> you get anxious, you can't sleep. Imagine someone coming up to you, it's like, why are you so anxious about the loss of your ring? It's just a piece of metal. <laughs> we know that's not true, right? Or think about the flag, right? The, the national flag, F-L-A-G, right? We just had a national day parade like fairly recently. Um, well, on the one hand, the flag is a little bit just like a piece of cloth. <laughs> It's really just fabric. But imagine that you were seated there at National Day Parade, and then you're seeing the person hoist or raise the flag, and it turns out that the flag was upside down. <laughs> I think the whole nation will be outraged, right? It's going to be like, it's going to make the uh, headlines, right? And so you see, what I'm saying here is that there is, usually symbols are not empty. They communicate something beyond themselves. Symbols point to something outside of itself. And in our minds, we rarely separate the symbol from what it symbolizes, from the actual substance, right? On the one hand, there is the symbol or the sign of the ring, but yet we know it communicates a covenant with one another in marriage. On the, on, on the one hand, we, we, we hear about the flag, you know, it's like just cloth and fabric, but yet it points to the nation and everything that it embodies. So in our mind, we don't really separate the sign and what it signifies. And friends, baptism, so is baptism. Baptism is a sign that points to something beyond itself. It's extremely rich in significance, but very often we are not aware. If I ask just by a show of hands, how many of us like, will say, how many of us were thinking of our baptism to strengthen our faith? How many of us actually do that? Probably not, or probably you're too shy to raise your hands, right? But think through this. I suspect... Most of us think about baptism as like, okay, we don't do like baptism certificates here, right? But if you come from another church that they print certificates, you know, I've gone through the motion, I've gone through the ritual, now I've got a baptism certificate, I frame it up on the wall, done and dusted, right? That's the way we think about baptism. Now, if that's what baptism is, obviously it's irrelevant to those of us who have already been baptized. It's only relevant to those who need to get baptized, right? But baptism is so much more than that. Now, friends, baptism is a picture or a display of our rich union with Jesus. You're going to hear me saying this to the point of death, okay? So I, I'm going to make no apologies about this. But I want to say that our text today, the main point is really this. Because baptism is a display of our rich union with Jesus, we are to walk in the light of our baptism. And the main points for this afternoon are as follows, right? Remembering our baptism strengthens our walk with one another. Remembering our baptism strengthens our walk with Jesus. Okay, same thing. Keep your Bibles open, please, so that you can track with me through the text. It's a fairly short text. I'm going to be making a lot of reference to it. So let's dive in. Remembering our baptism strengthens our walk with one another. Now, the church at Colossae is faced with the problem of a bunch of false teachers Right? They come in and they're smuggling in a, a kind of a higher Christian life teaching. They're like, if you want to attain to a fuller and a higher Christian life, uh, you need to abide by a set of rules and regulations that we are bringing to you. And in summary, Paul is telling the church, do not let anyone disqualify you. Do not let their false teaching judge you and tell you that you are less of a Christian. That's really the summary of the problem in Colossae. But let's take a quick look at the contours of what they are teaching so far. Look at 2 verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ, right? So you can see this teaching here on elemental spirits. Is that what it actually means here is that it's the focus on worldly principles and worldly philosophies. We know it has nothing to do with Jesus, but it has a lot to do with rules. If you want to have a get a flavor or a sense of this, look at 2 verse 21 uh, in your Bible, right? It says, do not touch, do not handle, do not taste, right? There's a lot of prohibitions here. In fact, some of these prohibitions actually border on asceticism. Look at 2 verse 23, right? This sense of self-deprivation. Stuff yourself, you know, watch your diet, maybe whip yourself a little bit in order to become more holy and to attain to the higher Christian life. 
That's the kind of teaching that these false teachers were smuggling in. But more worryingly, these teachers were using man-made rules as a criteria to judge the believers. Come with me to 2 verse 16. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you. 2 verse 18, let no one disqualify you. So it's not just that these false teachers are coming in and they are like teaching a whole new set of like, you know, rules and philosophy or whatever it is. What they are u- how they are using these worldly standards is that they are using these standards to disqualify the Christians. They are saying that you are not, you're not much of a Christian if you don't obey uh, the rules that we are bringing to you. Believing in Jesus is insufficient. In order to become a fuller Christian, you need to abide by some of the teaching that we are bringing to you. That's what they're saying. And Paul is saying this is dangerous, right? They're being disqualified as Christians by certain man-made standards. So Paul would have none of this. And 2 verse 6, Paul says, just as you have received Christ, so walk in Him. Continue to walk in Jesus. Do not move on from Him. Do not graduate from Him. Continue to be rooted in Christ. Continue to be built up in Him. You cannot move away from Jesus. Because if you turn to this false teaching, you are going to move away from Christ altogether. There's no Christ plus. It's Christ or nothing. There's no Christian walk without Christ. That's what Paul is saying. And why should they continue in Christ? And Paul says, because they are united with Jesus in whom is all the fullness. They have everything they need for life and godliness. They have everything they need for their walk. In other words, they are enriched by Jesus in their union with him. Let's take, a, let, let's take a look at a sampling of some of these verses. Look at 2 verse 10. Paul says, you have been filled in him, right? This is in Christ. Colossians 2 verse 11, in him you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. And he goes on to say it's the circumcision of Christ. 2 verse 13, God made together alive with him, having forgiven us of all our trespasses. The question is this. Sorry, let me, let, me, let me backpedal. I think Paul is saying that because you have all the riches in Christ, do not move away from Him. Do not depart from Him. Remember your union with Christ because you have all these riches in Him. Now, let me use an analogy, and I'm always using analogies. When it comes to union, it's like, you know, marriage analogies are really the best, right? I, okay, I, let me explain myself, okay? You know, in church, we do something called premarital counseling, and one of the things that we do, one of the sessions is um, finances, Right? And we tell them like, hey, it's good to like, merge your bank accounts and your finances because it reflects the oneness that you have with one another. Uh, inevitably, you will always notice someone cringing and shrinking in, uh, in his own seat or her seat. Right? It's like, oh, this is not fair. It's like, I'm so far ahead. You know? <laughs> my salary is so much more. I've been working so much longer. But then usually I'll have my eye trained at the other person who is secretly enjoying the moment <laughs> because he or she knows that she's going to be inheriting this fortune through union. <laughs> Now, friends, that's union with Christ. (laughs) When you're united with Jesus, you have everything that he does. What is true of him becomes true of us. Well, what picture does Paul use to portray this rich union? And the answer is baptism. Come with me to 2 verse 12. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in God. Now, if you ask ourselves like, how are we, Paul, how, how are we buried and raised with Christ? I mean, we weren't there, right, 2,000 years ago. We weren't at Calvary. So how were we exactly doing that? And the answer is through faith in God. That's the key verse, right? When we put our faith in God, when we believe in Jesus and what he says he has come to do and who he says he is, there's a sense in which the gospel story becomes our story. Jesus' dying and rising no longer remains as cold and abstract facts they become our story. When by faith we believe in Jesus and we are united with him, this is is not just like, you know, by the way, this happened 2,000 years ago. This is true of me now. Somehow I've died and I've risen because I've done so with Jesus. And, you know, I want to say that, like, the next time you go to a baptism, right, you, you, or you yourself go through a baptism and, and you see someone go into the water, I mean, don't just do this passively, right? Observe the baptism. It's a very beautiful picture. Someone goes into the water. 
fully submerged. And then he comes out. Now it's a reenactment of the gospel. It's an enactment of the glories of the gospel. It shows you Jesus dying and rising. It's the gospel made visible. But more than that, it's the gospel made personal. <laughs> That's what baptism is all about, friends. Just now after first service, someone came up to me and he was telling me about his baptism, which is very funny and uh, I wouldn't mention his story, but he was, he was saying that he needed to get baptized, but um, this was overseas. And, but, you know, the baptism pool was broken. So the pastor had to have, uh, you know, come up with this makeshift baptism, whatever, container where you can put enough water and the person inside that container. And so he passed by, I don't know what he passed by, and he managed to get this container and it turns out to be a coffin. <laughs> So that dear brother literally was baptized in a coffin. I said, how meaningful. <laughs> it's as symbolic as it gets. Dying in the coffin and rising with Christ. I was like, not to sell. I had to share the story in a second. But I can imagine some of us asking, like, look, if faith unites us to Jesus, why talk about Baptism. I mean, surely it's like good to have, but it's not absolutely necessary, right? Now, friends, I want to say that to, to split baptism and believing up, you know, it's a false dichotomy. It doesn't exist. Because in Scripture, to believe is to be baptized. To baptize is to be believed. You can't have one and not the other. Just look at 2 verse 12 again, right? Having been buried with him in baptism, and then what happens? In the same phrase he mentions, right, in which you're also raised with him through faith in God. If you have faith, you're baptized. If you're baptized, you have faith. I mean, I know in real life, the chronology is a little bit different. It's like, yeah, I believe in Jesus, you know, I pray the sinner's prayer, whatever it is, and then maybe like a few days later, a few months later, I get baptized. But in the minds of the New Testament authors, it is one and the same thing. It is distinct but inseparable. It comes in one package. There's no believing in Jesus without getting baptized in Jesus. It is one and the same thing. So friends, if we, very often we think about faith in a very invisible way, right? But think about this. How do we know that we have faith? Well, because that faith is expressed concretely through baptism. That's how the two are linked. And so even though we are saved by Christ through faith alone, that faith is expressed in our baptism. But friends, don't miss the point I've been saying so far, right? Baptism is a picture. Baptism is not just a concrete expression of our faith. Baptism is a picture of the rich union that we have with Jesus. Now, if that's the case, then it does change the way we relate to one another. Now, what do I mean by that, right? We're not to functionally disqualify or dismiss one another by worldly standards. Rather, we are to constantly point one another to our baptisms to remind us how rich we are in Christ Jesus. Now, let me explain myself a little bit, right? Let's apply this a little bit. Consider how we use, how we tend to disqualify people, how we sometimes knowingly or unknowingly or functionally, we just dismiss them as lesser Christians to worldly standards, right? Maybe it's the way we view them through a certain social economic lens. Maybe it's the way we view them through a certain educational background or through their career ambitions or the lack of which. There was a brother who is in RSC and he was um, visiting another church before he came to RSC. And, uh, you know, he was, uh, he, was, he was visiting, he was a newcomer, and so he, you know, there was this, like, meet and greet, which is what you guys had earlier. And I know meet and greet is wonderful for the pastors, you know, like, when you look down, it's like everybody's chatting, it's so wonderful, but it's a nightmare for the introverts, right? <laughs> and so he plucked up enough courage, and he's like, hey, how are you? They exchanged a couple of conversations. At some point, the girl whom he was talking to was angling for him to ask a question. It's like, ask me about where I studied. <laughs> And so he did. He's like, so where do you study? You know, where do you do your like, college or university? And he's like, uh, yeah, I was from Cornell. And he was like, where's Cornell? <laughs> Is it famous? <laughs> it became so awkward. He was so traumatized by the incident, he never went back to the church anymore. Thank God, that's why he's in RAC. <laughs> <laughs> but friends, jokes aside, we must be careful. I mean, I don't think, I suspect none of us would do something like that. But we must be careful that even though we don't disqualify someone as Christians, neither do we functionally exclude them because of their background. 
do we exclude people who are unlike us from our conversations, from our homes, from our hangouts? But the reverse is true as well, right? Some of us, we come from a humble background. And we use our humble background as a moral high ground. <laughs> it's like, I'm so different. I'm so grounded, you know, like, I hate on my shoulders. I'm local. Yeah, it's like, look at those guys. They're spending so much money eating lunch, and I can spend $3.50 on economic rice, right? <laughs> or like, I just go to JB for my vacation, and those guys go to like Alaskan cruises or something like that. No, guys, I, I'm saying... We disqualify one another, and this disqualification can go in both directions. Let's be careful here. Well, we may not disqualify one another to worldly standards. We might disqualify one another to pseudo-Christian principles, right? It's like if someone has gone through a certain initiation right, then maybe, maybe that person is more of a worthy Christian. Maybe that person need to have gone through a breakthrough weekend, certain discipleship program, speak in tongues, I know we don't do that in RAC, right? I mean, like, we, not these, we're above these things, right? Absolutely. Let me get closer to home, right? Gospel centrality. And we thank God for that, right? We really love Jesus. And we thank God that everything that we want to do, all of our lives, all of our ministry, is motivated by what Jesus has done for us. We serve out of an overflow of knowing Jesus' person and work. But guys, the irony becomes when we want to be so proud of being so gospel-centered, that it becomes our badge of honor by which we judge other people. This person is not as gospel-centered. This church is not as gospel-centered. They're not like us. We're different. And the irony is that the same gospel that welcomed us in spite of who we are becomes the very boundary marker by which we exclude others. So friends, beware that we don't dismiss or disqualify other Christians based on man-made standards. So positively then, how do we walk with one another in the light of our baptisms? Two things here I want to say. First, strengthen one another through reminders of our baptisms. What I mean by that is like, if baptism really represents my rich union with Christ, now imagine a brother or a sister coming. I mean, just now Divya was really very vulnerable. She started with like her highs and lows, etc., etc., right? And often we go through seasons when Christ is weak in us. What do we do? We point them to, our, to, to, to his baptism, to our baptism. Why? Why do I say that? Because baptism is a picture of their rich union with Christ. The analogy is a little bit like that. It's like someone who is like homeless, destitute, struggling to eat, but he has a check sticking out of his pocket. And what you do is you take out that check and you say, hey, you know what? There's $1 million. All you need to do is to cash this in. And friends, the check, baptism is exactly like this check. You point to someone's baptism, not because baptism in and of itself means anything, but we have looked so far as that baptism represents our rich union with Christ. You are reminding him or her how rich you are in Christ. When you feel that you cannot continue, you have more resources than you realize. So we strengthen one another by pointing one another to our baptisms. But the second thing, the second way we can walk in light of baptism, we learn to connect with one another on the basis of our shared baptism connect to one another on the basis of a shared baptism. Now, what does it mean to be Christian? Now, friends, being a Christian is not just being disciplined, not just getting my act together, reading the Bible, coming to church. Those things are good, right? But when you become a Christian, at the heart, the most fundamental thing about becoming a Christian is that you're united with Christ. And this union is so complicated that even Paul is struggling to articulate it, right? Remember Galatians 2 when he says, like, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. But the life that I now live, wait a minute, Paul, so is it Christ who lives or I who lives? It's complicated, right? But, but friends, the union is so deeply redefining of our most fundamental identity that it changes the way we relate to people. You know why? Because we connect out of our most fundamental identity. Now, let me explain this a little bit, right? So if we view our ethnicity as our fundamental identity, we connect with those, we connect most readily with those who are in our ethnic groups. If we view our career ambitions, career pathways as our fundamental identity, we connect with those who share similar career ambitions. If we view suffering as our fundamental identity, we connect most easily with sufferers and those who struggle in every single day, right? Right? 
But what if our most, our deepest fundamental identity is that we're united with Christ? Which means it changes the way we connect with other believers. Now, Martin Lloyd-Jones, a British preacher in the previous century, he, um, he, was a, he was a doctor, he was an assistant to the Queen's physician before he became a preacher. And he was recounting this story, which is very fascinating. He was saying that he went to a play. This was before he was caught as a pastor. He went to a play, he emerged from the play... And he saw a Salvation Army band and they were singing hymns to Jesus. At that moment, he said, he immediately knew that he belonged to them and they belonged to him. These are my people. In fact, he felt this fundamental connection with them so deep that it far surpasses the connection that he has with his doctor friends with whom he dines, you know, and fine dine or whatever it is and drink wine and what, whatever doctors do. No, not in Singapore, I'm sure. <laughs> he feels this deep connection with them, right? Now, friends, we connect most readily out of our most fundamental identity. Now, the question you ask me is like, what is this got to do with baptism? <laughs> Remember, baptism represents, it's a picture of our union with Christ. So deep is our union with Christ that Paul We'll even go on to say in Ephesians 4 that we have one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. Wait a minute, Paul. Can't be right. In this room, there are 450 people. There must be at least 380 baptisms. No, there's one baptism. Because there's a sense in which all of us have a common union with a common Savior. And therefore, we have a shared baptism. Friends, my point is this. Let your shared baptism, which expresses your union, help you connect with people in church. And why did I take some, so much time to come on this? Because very often, and this is just not just you, but me as well, when we talk about, I hear this comment very often, I can't connect with people in church because they, they don't understand, they, are, they don't go through my life season, they don't share the same life stage. And it's true, I get it, and it's true. I'm not dismissing that at all. But I'm, I also want to encourage us here, if our fundamental identity is union with Christ, then it automatically forms a union with Christ's body. And that's my encouragement to you. So that's how we learn to walk in the light of our baptism. But let's go to the second point. Remembering our baptism strengthens our walk with Jesus. Remember 2 verse 6, Paul says that just as you have received Christ, so walk in Him, continue in Him, right? And the reason he gives us is because we are rich in Christ. We have all the resources we need to walk with Jesus. But the question is this, what kind of resources do we need? Why do we need these resources? Now, friends, again, if Christianity is mainly just getting our act together and doing stuff and like reading the Bible and stuff, the only resources you need is sermon resources online. <laughs> but Paul is not saying that. Paul is saying that you need all the riches that you need in Christ Jesus because the reality is far graver than you know. Because in reality, we have, we have dark forces that are against us. You know, before you're a Christian, you have one enemy whose name is God. <laughs> And he's a very kind enemy. I think we can all agree that. And suddenly, after you become Christian, we have three enemies. 300% increase. <laughs> it's like now I have to deal with sin in my heart. Now I have to deal with the world. Now I have to deal with Satan. Now friends, unless we realize the forces that are arrayed against us, we don't see why we need these riches in Christ. And so Paul wants us to know that our baptism displays our rich union with Christ. Why? Because he has overcome our enemies. And I'm going to zoom in on two. Christ has overcome sin and Christ has overcome Satan. Let's take this one at a time, right? Uh, Christ has overcome sin in two ways. He has overcome the power of sin and he has overcome the guilt of sin, okay? So let, let's start with this, right? Let's look at 2 verse 11. Christ frees us from the power of sin. In him, that's Christ, also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, that means it's not a physical circumcision he's referring to, but putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism. So Paul explicitly says this is not physical circumcision we are talking about here, right? The body of flesh lingo in Paul's usage refers to the power of sin. It refers to the mastery of sin, how sin dominates us in our bodies before we come to Christ. To put it very simply, if you're not a Christian or before you're a Christian, you can never say no to sin. And you say, oh no, that's not true. You know, I, always, you know, I, I freely say no to Jesus, right? And yeah, of course, because we are free and we are acting according to our nature, the only thing we can do is to say 
yes to sin and no to Christ. And that's what Paul is saying. But what happened in Christ, we received the circumcision of Christ. Christ spiritually cuts off. That's what circumcision means. He cuts off the body of flesh. He cuts off the power of sin so that if you're in Christ, you can technically say no to sin. You can actually say no to sin. But baptism doesn't just display our union with Christ who overcame sin's power, but also sin's guilt. Let's look at 2 verse 13. You were dead in your trespasses and God made a life with Christ, having forgiven us of our trespasses. Now, wh- when did that happen? When, we were, when, when were we made alive? Remember, in baptism. What happens when you are made alive? Answer, having forgiven us of our trespasses. Our sins are forgiven when we are being made alive with Christ. And to bring home the imagery Christ, that Christ has overcome guilt, he gives us a very graphic picture. Right? He gives us a graphic picture of like, the record of that in 2 verse 14. Now, in those days, every criminal who is crucified has a signage on top of his head, nailed to the cross. It records the exact wrongdoings that he has committed against the state. It is a record of that, if you like. And Paul is using this imagery to say that against God, we all have a record of that. Because God is the one who made us, we owe him joyful worship and joyful obedience, but we don't. Because God is our king, we owe him joyful allegiance, but we don't. We spit in his face and we decided to pursue a a path without him. But yet what he has done in Christ Jesus is to take the record of death and he nailed it to the cross. It is finished. Our sins are forgiven. That's what Paul is saying. And so we see our baptism displays our union with Christ who overcomes sin, right? Both the power of sin and the guilt of sin. But let's go on as well. Our baptism also displays our union with Christ who overcame Satan. Look at 2 verse 15 with me. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and he put them to open shame by triumphing over them. Now the rulers and authorities do refer to Satan and his forces and very often you read a verse like this, you're like, oh, hmm. So this must be a verse about spiritual possession and exorcism and... (laughs) But guys, in context, that's not what it means because Paul has just been speaking about how Christ has overcome sin and somehow when Christ overcomes sin he also inevitably disarms Satan. So his overcoming of Satan is because he has overcome the guilt and the power of sin. Now, let me explain myself. What do I mean by that? How is Satan disarmed when Christ frees and forgives us? Two ways. Satan is disarmed and stripped of his power to tempt. So Satan has two powers. He can tempt and he can accuse. Satan is stripped of his power to tempt because, because what? Because the power of sin has been broken. If the power of sin has been broken and we can now say no to sin, then Satan's ability to tempt us has weakened tremendously. But not only that, Satan also has the power to accuse, right? But now Satan cannot accuse because the record of that has been nailed to the cross. If Satan says to me, hey, Kyung, like, why should you go back to God? And I, I mean, right? And, and God will say, but I have wiped clean the slate. I have wiped clean his record of death. Satan has no case in accusing you, in accusing those who are in Christ. He has no grounds and he has no case. But folks, in reality, we know that even though Christ has broken the power of sin and he has forgiven us of sin's guilt and he has disarmed Satan, it doesn't feel like that. If we're honest with ourselves, it feels more often than not we find ourselves in Satan's temptation. And then more often than not, we find ourselves being accused by Satan. Why does that happen? Satan is notorious for something called a one-two punch. There are two punches here, right? I'm using a boxing an- uh, metaphor or analogy. I don't even know whether this is true, okay? I've heard it somewhere. So if you're, if you're really into boxing, please forgive me. It's like I didn't check up this at all, right? Now, the first punch is the punch of temptation. Even though there's no power of sin that grips us, Satan comes to us and you know what he says? He says, it's okay to sin. Just enjoy yourself. Game the system. God is generous to forgive. Jesus will always forgive you. (laughs) Then after we sin, he does the second punch, which is the daily punch, right? You know what he says? Oh gosh, 
Now that you have sinned, you are so filthy, you are so defiled, you are so covered in the grime of sin that God will never want you back. You are so unworthy. In fact, I think you have out God's forgiveness and grace. In fact, I think you have gone so far that God will never welcome you back ever again. If the first punch says, Jesus will always forgive, the second punch says, Jesus will never forgive. And friends, think about it. That's the reason why instead of running to Jesus for forgiveness, we pursue all sorts of alternatives, right? We try to earn forgiveness by repenting very, very hard. There's nothing wrong in like repenting and receiving forgiveness, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying there's a kind of wrong for repentance where we bash ourselves up, we try to work up sorrow from within, and we feel that if we've shared enough tears and we feel sorry enough, maybe that will obligate God to receive us back. Now, that looks like repentance, but it's not. It's works-based. Or maybe we don't even want to seek forgiveness. We're just like, you know what? I'm so done. I will just not read my Bible. I will just not like pray. And I will just like pretend that nothing has happened. Maybe give it three weeks, four weeks, and you know, time will renew everything. Time will reset everything. Maybe God will forget. <laughs> it sounds a little bit uncannily with the way we deal with our family relationships, right? It's like, yeah, we quarrel, we fight. Let's not talk about it. Sweep it under the rug. And then three weeks later, we are A-OK. But can you see what Satan is doing here? The one-two punch. And I want to say there's something in common between the one-two punch, right? In the first punch, when he tempts us, he says, Jesus always forgives. In the second punch, he says, Jesus will never forgive, right? In the first punch, he's saying that Jesus' forgiveness is very, very cheap. Grace is cheap. In the second punch, he's saying that Jesus' forgiveness is very limited and narrow, but there's something in common here. He's trying to introduce a distortion, a distorted view of Jesus' forgiveness here. When we see that Jesus' forgiveness is cheap, we have a low view of his forgiveness. When we see that his forgiveness is limited and narrow, we also have a low view of forgiveness. The question then, therefore, is how do we use our baptism to fight the lies of Satan? when he introduces a distortion like this. Well, on the one hand, as I've spoken and I will say it again, right? we must remember our baptism because it tells us of the resources that we have. We have been forgiven. We have been freed from the power of sin and Satan cannot tempt and he cannot accuse us. That's true. But friends, there's something else I want us to remember here. The resources that we have in Jesus point us to another baptism, a far better baptism, do you know that in the Gospels, Jesus was baptized? He was said to be baptized twice. I don't know whether you have this, um, you know, when you talk to the people around you, and I was trying out with my wife, right? He's like, hey, dear, do you know why Jesus got baptized? Ah, not that you mentioned. <laughs> He's not a sinner, so he doesn't need to be baptized. And actually, he d- if baptism means following Jesus, he doesn't have to follow himself, right? So <laughs> why is Jesus getting baptized? But friends, Jesus got baptized because he wanted to identify with sinners. That's why he went to the water. That's why he went to the river Jordan. But that's not it. Because that baptism, that water baptism, pointed to another baptism which we are less familiar with. And I want us to, I want you to come with me to uh, Mark chapter 10. This is the night before Jesus was crucified. And look at what he says. Jesus said to them, are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I'm baptized? Jesus is talking about a baptism of death, a baptism of judgment, a baptism of the cross. Friends, Jesus' baptism tells us that forgiveness is not cheap because the eternal Son of God came down to earth to take on flesh, not just so that he can be baptized in water, but so that he can be baptized in the fiery wrath of God. Has it ever occurred to you that all the circumcisions, all the physical stuff, right, circumcisions in the Old Testament and baptisms in the New Testament, they're all symbolic, but they ultimately point to and culminate in the one and only actual circumcision and baptism, which is the baptism of Jesus when he was baptized into God's judgment on behalf of our sins. When he was cut off, he was circumcised from the presence of God for our sake. 
So Jesus' baptism tells us that forgiveness is not cheap, but neither is forgiveness limited or narrow because if his baptism was that of the crucifixion, then as surely as Jesus was crucified once and for all, so surely is our record of that being nailed with him once and for all. It is finished. To summarize this, our baptism is a response to Jesus' baptism. Jesus identified himself with us in his baptism so that our sins become his. And in response, we identify ourselves with Jesus in our baptism so that his riches become ours. Jesus was baptized into judgment while we are baptized into his riches. So friends, when I say walk in the light of your baptism, remember what your baptism entails. It entails knowing how rich you are, the resources of being forgiven, the resources of being freed from the power of sin. But there will be days when you're affronted by Satan and the thing to do is to let our baptism point to that greater baptism. Our baptism is only symbolic, but Jesus' baptism was actual. Listen to what Martin Luther says and how he encourages us with the use of baptism. We must hold boldly and fearlessly to our baptism and hold it up against all sins and terrors of conscience and humbly say, I know full well that I have not a single work which is pure, but I am baptized. And through my baptism, God who cannot lie has bound himself in covenant with me not to count my sin against me, but to slay it and to blot it out. Now friends, that's how we use our baptism. Against Satan, against sin. And in closing, I want to speak to two groups of people. I want to speak to uh, the first group that I want to address is some of us in the midst here, we are Christian, we have professed faith, and we're really struggling to get baptized. And understandably, right, because many of you tell the pastors, tell me, it's like, I'm sorry to get baptized, I fear backlash from my family, I'm really worried, I don't want to strain the relationships in my family, it's, there's already alienation that happens between us. Now, oh, friends, I want to say something. When Jesus invites you to be baptized, first and foremost, he has gone ahead of you in baptizing himself. In his baptism, he has faced ultimate alienation. In his baptism, he was really cut off from his father. And I want that to sink in, that reality. I want you to see how rich his baptism is. And if you're struggling and you're like, yeah, this is something I've been trying to like stave off, but now you're bringing it up again. If you're struggling, come up and talk to me. Come and talk to one of the pastors, elders, after the service. We really want to pray with you. We really want to process with you. Now, the second group of us are those who have been baptized. Now, remember that your baptism is a display of your rich union with Jesus. Now friends, this means that baptism is not primarily about your commitment to follow Jesus. Now, let me say this again carefully. Many of us think of baptism as our commitment to follow Jesus. But if that is the definition of baptism primarily for you and me, then remembering our baptism will be very traumatic. Because every time I look back at my baptism, I'm reminded of my failure to live up to my promise to Jesus. But if baptism is all about my rich union with Christ, then it's very different. It's a comforting exercise every time we talk about our baptisms because you're reminding each other, know how rich you are in Jesus. Know how rich you are in Jesus. You know, in, I begin the sermon wanting to say that God wants to tell us the gospel in word, but not just that. He wants to appeal to our senses. And in the same vein, I want to say, God wants to tell us we're rich in Christ but not just in word, but he wants us to hear the gospel in a very visceral and tangible way, in this case through baptism. You know, have you ever considered why married couples hold hands? If you think about it, like holding hands doesn't really change anything in the marriage, right? I mean, technically speaking, it doesn't change like the marital union, it doesn't change the marital status. It neither adds to nor subtracts from the the, 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 the marriage, any more than baptism adds to or subtracts from the salvation, from our salvation. But yet, hand-holding is a very fascinating thing because when I hold my wife's hand, I'm communicating something to her, right? I'm saying, I love you, you are mine and I'm yours. I'm saying, we're in this together. I'm saying, let me lead you and I'm not going to let you go. 
Now, friends, baptism is a little bit like hand holding. As far as God is concerned, you know what He'll say? There will be days when you feel you cannot continue. There will be days when you feel that you're battered and buffeted by trials and tribulations and sin within and sin without. There will be days when your journey is fraught with enemies and you feel that you just cannot continue anymore. And God says to you, look at the riches you have in my son and do that by beholding baptism because that's my gift to you. Baptism is God's confirm plus chop love to us. Shall we pray? Father God, against the enemies of sin and Satan, we have no hope in our walk. Left to our own devices and resources, we cannot do anything. But Jesus is our champion. Like David who defeated Goliath on behalf of Israel, Jesus is that greater David who has defeated both sin and Satan. And not only that, you have granted us all the riches in Jesus. And we thank you for that. And I pray when we leave from this place, I pray that baptism is not just a good concept for many of us here. It is you pressing in the gift of something visceral and tangible It is you pressing in how much you love us and how much you want us to know that we have everything we need for this walk. So help us to point one another to baptism. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You've been listening to a sermon podcast from Redemption Hill Church. You can find more of our sermons online at www.rhc.org.sg.